the upper room. And so the upper room experience is what it was proof that he made it back to the throne. Complete victory in his hands. That was the proof of that. He made it back to the right hand of God the Father. He regained Adam's seat. He had taken it all back. He had given you and I the authority again. He had brought it back to us that we could live in it in this earthly realm. No wonder he said, now you go and you cast out the devil and you lay hands on the sick and they'll recover and you do these things because he showed that he made it back and he sent the second crowning in the power of the Holy Ghost that day in the upper room. And man, it filled that room. It filled the earth with a sound of a rushing mighty wind. It wasn't a rushing mighty wind. It was the sound of one. I believe it carried the sound of God breathing into Adam's nostrils, the breath of lives. I believe it, it was the sound that a second crowning had taken place and man now could stand up and walk out in the authority in the name of Jesus and with the power of the Holy Ghost. And so the birth, if it had to stop there, it would have only accomplished a little. If it had stopped at the cross, only a little more. At the tomb, only more. At the resurrection, explosive as it was, it would have accomplished so much more. But the ascension, once he ascended and was seated at the right hand of God the Father, then the second crown and coronation began to take place. And the last Adam sat on the seat of mercy, making intercession for you and I. And he said, you will know I made it back when I send the comforter to you. And so they went to the upper room. And they were seated there waiting on that promise, waiting on that, believing in faith that he made it back to where they saw him ascend. And without the upper room, the ascension would not have finished it. And he sent the, the Holy Ghost to live in every man. And now here we are at this place. And as great and powerful as all of this is, as great and powerful as it all sounds, and it's all true. You see the power of it when Peter and John walked up to the gate called Beautiful. After that, when Jesus rose from the dead, remember, he came and breathed on his disciples. He breathed on them. In John chapter 20, I believe it is, he breathed on them. And what he said was, he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. That's the day they got born again. The upper room was the crowning. And so man is supposed to walk in the consciousness. He breathed on them the consciousness of his own victory, of everything that he did. He breathed on them everything he had accomplished in his birth, his death, his burial, his, de uh, his descension into hell, his paying the price, his raising again, his ascension back to the throne, his seated at the right hand of God the Father. And what it was was a resounding shout in the upper room, I made it back. I'm here. And here is the comforter promised. And the mighty Holy Ghost roared into that upper room. And tongues like as a fire licked out and set down upon each one of them. Now we say, what could be greater than this? There was something shown to the apostles, something shown to, to Peter, John, and James in Luke chapter 9. I want you to put that on the screen, Luke chapter 9, and I want to show you something, something that the Lord has been talking to me about. And this maybe be, is something that you haven't seen quite like this before, but in Luke chapter 9, let me get there with you. Hallelujah. Verse 28, let's start right there. 
And I want you to see this. Luke 9, 28. And it came to pass about an eight days after these things, he took Peter and John and James and went up to a, into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two that stood with them, with him. Now, here is the thing, my brother and sister. Peter, John, and James saw something they had never seen before. Now, this was before the death, before the burial, before the resurrection, before the ascension, before the upper room. They saw something they had never seen before in front of them. For so long, listen now, have people longed to see the glory of the Lord here in this world. But beloved, here's a key. I believe to see the glory of God, that you're going to have to pull away to a private place. Listen close. At some point, at some time in our life, you're going to have to see him transfigure before your eyes. You've got to see the transfiguration for yourself. The transfiguration of the glistening glory of God that began to shine through him. It was on that mountain that day he revealed who he was in his majesty. He, they saw his majesty. They saw him as Messiah. They saw him as the king. They saw him that he was the Old and the New Testament coming together at the same time on one mountain. They saw him transfigured. Believers refuse to see him transfigured. They refuse to see him like that. We have to finally awake to his splendor, his brightness, to his, uh, to his majesty, to his excellence, to his preeminence, his dignity, his grace, his majesty. If we never awake to this, we will never see the glory. It came that day. We identify with his birth at Christmas. We identify with his death on the cross. And some cling to the cross. Some take hold of the cross and hold to it. And we even write songs clinging to the cross, clinging to the cross. But no, let go of that. After you've come to the cross, go to the resurrection. After the resurrection, go to the upper room. After the upper room, after the upper room, go to the ascension. Or go to the ascension. Then after that, go to the upper room and receive the second crowning. But there's something he showed long before that. The transfiguration. He became something different in their minds. He became something different than they'd ever seen before. It so marked their minds. It so marked their thinking that they saw the transfiguration of Jesus. And they saw his raiment glowing and glistening with majesty and, and excellence and dignity. They saw him for who he really is and the glory. They woke up to it. They were asleep. But yet they woke up and there he was standing in his transfigured state. And they looked up and immediately they saw Moses and Elijah talking to him about what he would accomplish in his death. It was in a, a whole, almost a paradox, but not so. It, was, it came from, and in the Old Testament at one time, Moses said, show me your glory. And God caught him up and take, took him from that time to that mountain right there, Tabor maybe. Took him right there to that mountain to see the transfiguration. Elijah was in the same cleft of the rock at another time. And he wrapped a tallit around him. And he heard the voice speak to him. He heard the still, small voice talk. He was, I believe he was here. Hearing Jesus. And it carried him into the future. 
What kind of God can take people from, and then Peter, James, and John, Jesus physically said, come with me aside. Come up the mountain with me. What kind of God can take people from different time frames, different places, different, uh, whole different places and make them all arrive at the same time in one spot? Only a God who lives out of time. Only a God. And Jesus showed him who he was and was transfigured in front of his, their eyes. You've got to see the transfiguration. You've got to enter into that kind of thing. You've got to start to see him transfigured in front of you. That he's not the lowly Jesus in the manger anymore. He's not the suffering Messiah hanging on the cross anymore. He's not dead buried in a tomb that he's in hell paying the price after three days and nights and being trying to be annihilated by demonic powers. He's not that, that person anymore. He rose up from the dead. He's not walking in that anymore. Messiah ben Joseph, the suffering Messiah, has already come. But not now. He wanted his men to see him in the future to come as Messiah ben David, as the conquering Messiah. They saw him on the other side. They saw him in his majesty, who he really was. The scripture said they were speechless. They didn't know what to say. They were just talking and started up talking. Let us build three churches, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And he said they didn't know what they were saying as they entered into the glory. This all happened in the glory. We keep saying the glory's coming, the glory's coming, the glory's coming, the greater glory's coming. It's coming, it's coming. Yes, it's coming. And yes, it is sitting on the uh, poised, ready to show itself. But we as the church of the Lord Jesus must see him transfigured. We have to see the transfiguration. We have to see him. We have to see him the way the apostle John saw him when he heard the voice and he fell at his feet and he said his hair was white as snow, his eyes like fire. Yeah. We have to see him transfigured in front of our eyes. If we can see that, we can walk into the glory. Hallelujah. Well, that's what I wanted to tell you today. I wanted to tell you that. I wanted to tell you there's a lot more to it. And I will talk about it as, as the Lord lets me. It says his clothes became glistening. In this verse, glistening is the word to send forth lightning. To lightning, to flash out like lightning. When you see him transfigured inside your spirit, lightnings become available to flash out of you. To flash out when you lay your hands on someone, the lightnings of God flash out of your hands and heal them and burn that sickness out of their body. Burn drugs out of their veins. Burn that crawling, decrepit worm that crawls in the veins of a drug addict and a heroin addict. To burn it out, the lightnings of God light up their identity in them. And suddenly they become alive, free of that bondage. When you can see him transfigured. You must see the transfigured Christ. You've seen the, the lowly Christ in the manger. You've seen the Christ of miracles that walked on the earth. You've seen the, the, the dying Christ on the cross. You've seen the buried Christ in the tomb. You've seen the one who went into hell and paid the price. You've seen the resurrected king, the resurrected Christ, when he came up out of the tomb defeating death, hell, and the grave. You've seen the ascended Christ when he went back to the right hand of the Father. Remember, he said, touch me not, I have not yet ascended to my Father. Then you've seen him ascend. Then you've seen 
the Christ and the Holy Ghost baptizing you in fire and power. Power and fire. But have you seen the transfigured one? Have you seen that in your life? He is waiting on us to look into his transfiguration so that we can walk in the glory it brings. When that happens, it's the long-awaited glory train. It's the long-awaited glory train that's coming. It's the long-awaited glory that will settle over services until people stand up out of wheelchairs without even being told to. It's the, it's the long-awaited glory when you walk through to maybe go to decoration to decorate a loved one's grave. And when you step in the cemetery, the ground rumbles around you. It rumbles around you showing something that is to come. It is that kind of glory that we're looking to, to see. It will come when we pull aside long enough to see the transfigured Christ. Hallelujah. Once this glory appears, then the lightning, the lightning will flash from the believer and heal and deliver and set free. But in order to see this, we must allow the Christ to be transfigured before us. If you trap him or confine him in the manger, we behold he's come, but if we can find him there, we'll never know his miracles. We'll never, if we never get out of the power over, over the elements he showed, we'll never see his healing power. If we don't get out of that and go further, we'll never see his power over the dead to raise the dead. We will go by these places, but we cannot dwell there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus wanted his men to see his majesty. He wants us to see his majesty, his state as king and Messiah. His, his fully fulfilling the law of the prophets, he wants us to know him there. He is the old and the new covenants together. In Luke 9, 34, it said, they entered into the cloud. We are to enter into the cloud and take it back to the public as lightnings flashing from our being. We are to listen to the voice of Jesus. We do not know how to operate in the glory without him. Luke 9, 35, the father said, this is my beloved son, hear him. The Father has never said this about any other religious leader in existence but Jesus. This is him. Hear him. No other religious leader is transfigured like this. He towers above them all. and he, he welcomes all challengers. He brings them all. He hath thrown down the gauntlet. And said, I am he who was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and hell. And he threw down that gauntlet for any other religious leader who would ever claim to be God and said, come and pick it up if you dare. They never picked it up. Their bones are dust to this day. But not long from this day, I'll preach in front of the tomb where, no, where, where millions come to see nothing. Because he's not there. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And it is time, my beloved brother and sister, as a, 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 we have to see him in his transfigured state. So that those lightnings can flash from us. Hallelujah. Begin to let him be transfigured before your eyes. From the lowly man of Galilee to the glistening lightning flashing of his splendor, the Messiah. The only one. Glory to the living God. Hallelujah. Father, I pray. I pray now that everyone watching will see him transfigured. When they will meditate on him, Lord, until they see him as King Messiah. They see him as the 
as the conquering of all impossibilities in their lives. Lord God, that hope will spring forth as they see every impossibility conquered. Let them see him as the, as the glorious, splendorous, lightning-flashing Messiah that absolutely conquered it all and is here today. Lord, may your church see it in such a way. May it come alive in us in such a big way that when we go out to minister, go out to preach, that whole congregations fall on their face before the Almighty and give you glory. Lord, let us see it in such a way that the glory pushes out the evil. The evil of politics, the evil rulers, the evil tyrants, that they cannot stand in such a presence of a lightning flashing God. Let the world see your enemies fall in front of you. Let them see them fall on a live camera feed, that they will fall on their face in front of the world, that they may know there is only one God and Dagon is not him. And all these spirits and these tyrants that say that they are above your word, they are the spirit of Dagon trying to rise above the Christ. Let them fall, Lord, with their head and hands laying before them, severed from them. Their authorities, their work, their head and hands, let it be not recognized anymore in a sensible world. Let false prophets that rise up and say Jesus is not the Christ let their tongues wither. Let them come to silence should they refuse. Lord God, for these men who hold up money over men and women and dangle it in front of them and exercise power over them. For these, Lord God, that would entrap your youth, your heritage, your children. The little ones, Lord, the teenagers, the college age, that they are hypnotizing them with demonic, hellish power through their phones and through technological world. Lord, bind these men up with your word and your glory that they can't operate there. Let the world see that they shave like other men, that they have to bathe like other men, that when they wake up, their hair is standing everywhere just like any other man. And let them see, Lord, that they have a facade of power, and they wake up. And, Lord, they have prophesied a woke crowd, a woke crowd, a woke Crowd, well, Lord, I ask you in the literal sense of the word, let them wake up to the resurrection. Wake up to the risen Christ. Wake up and see them. And see him and see all that he's done. Let them wake up and see him. They have prophesied it. So in the literal sense of the word, Lord, open the eyes of the people that they may see and see you. Open the eyes of cowardly churches. Cowardly churches that will not let a prophet speak, will not let tongues be given in a message, will not let this happen in the public service. Who are you? Who are you to hold back the fire of the second crowning of God? Who are you to stifle the language of the Holy Ghost? Who are you? Shut up. Let them speak. Let the Holy Ghost move. Let him come in and show you what you can't do. That only he can do. And he'll make you the preacher you were supposed to be 
He'll make you the pastor you were supposed to be. He'll make you the teacher you should have been. He'll make you the evangelist. That's his friend. He'll make you the prophet that's fearless and bold. And he'll make you the apostle that's hot and not cold. Back out of his way and let him speak. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. He is Messiah from the Hebrew to the Greek. Who are you, old man, to tell God he can't talk? Who are you, old politician, to try to squeeze the life out of his people? Who are you to kill the unborn that you didn't give life to to start with? It was his breath and his lightning and his power that made the seed grow. Who are you to stand up and say, I will kill God's heritage? Who are you drunk on power, dying and squealing in your beds in the end? For you'll realize what short a time you really had on this earth. And you will never saw an expected end. Who are you? Supreme Court Justice that stands and says, I am bigger than God. Or who are you to stand and say, there is no God? Breathe carefully. Breathe lightly. For you don't believe that, surely. For the day you really believe that, you may find it hard to catch the next breath. Who are you? Tyrants of the earth that say God is not here. And who will save them? Let them call on their God if he'll answer, if he'll have them. Who are you to say such things? You're just men. You're just men. And one of you have a urinary tract infection right now that proves you're not God. Who are you? To stand against the living God. Who is this living God? He's the God of this Bible right here. He's the one who spoke in the beginning. Light be. And there was such a trembling and earthquakes and lightning and explosions that if a man had have been there and to see it, his bones would have give way under him. That's the God. He's the God of Isaiah 40 who held the world in the palm of his hand, who meted out the heavens with a nine-inch span from the tip of his thumb to the tip of his little finger. That's who God is. And you're not him. You can only be in one place at one time. He's everywhere today. You're not God. Only one God the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Hear the word, Netanyahu. God is with you. He will fight alongside you. Hide yourself in his pavilion, for surely the anointing of David has come upon you now. And this is the day you come out of the cave. Stand tall, stand strong, and roar like the lion you are. For this is the day, says the Lord of hosts and grace, that I am going to take my prophet Netanyahu very far. Hallelujah. Beware, you ravenous birds of Persia that seek to blow up Israel before my face. For you are calling the God who defeated Pharaoh out to war. And you can't even hold my presence in your place. I will march through your caves where you're birthing these birds to kill and destroy and cause all this harm. 
For even now, something is going terribly wrong in your caves. Hear the alarm? Take your hands from Israel, leave them alone. Touch not my anointed, says the one who sits on the throne. Hallelujah. The Lord says, I'm going to do a great revival in Greece. Greece. For there, they were the ones who said, I would see Jesus. So the Lord says, yea, I will let you see Jesus. You ask, your forefathers ask, and now is the time for you to see him. I'm going to bring a love train through all these places, even violence of Hamas. There will be many born again, many saved that were lost. Saudi Arabia, the Lord says, I know you're scared, but turn to me today. Turn to me today, and I'll be the strength of your beard. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow. Was somewhere else for a little while. Where could I have been, maybe you say? Maybe in the transfigured Christ. In this time today. Hallelujah. I wonder sometimes why God talks in rhyme when I get over in those areas. I think he's putting rhythm and harmony to it, laying it in place. You know, amen, amen. A great revival's coming. The Lord is, the Lord has Netanyahu on his mind. He has people in all the surrounding nations, even even those who mean harm. There's a revival breaking out in a lot of these places. And I'll tell you something that, that's really something to me. Not that it's impossible. It's how the Lord made the connection. The Greeks said, I would see Jesus. So the Lord said, okay, the time has come for you to see Jesus. He's going to let them see him. Hallelujah. Come on, Krista. Receive our offering today. Tell the people how to prosper. It's a strong prophetic presence up here right now. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, the way you prosper first and foremost is by inviting Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. You will not even make the step in the right direction to prosper without him. The world's definition of prosperity is not even in this, this word anywhere. They've, they've come up with it on their own. They've tried, to, they've tried to go every other route except the Scripture. And guess what? It's a dead end every street you turn on. But this word right here tells you exactly how to prosper. And the Scripture says that Jesus was the Word made flesh. And so when you invite him to be your Lord and Savior in your life over everything, then will you make the step in the right direction to prosper. So before we go any further, I want to invite you to know Jesus on a personal level, to know him, not just hear about him, not just, not, not just listen to stories about Jesus, not just listen to the stories of the manger, of the cross, of the resurrection, but to know the resurrection himself. He is a person. It says the resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. So you will have to know resurrection himself means when that is in your life, you have resurrection power over everything in your life, every area, spiritually, physically, and financially. And the scripture makes it the easiest thing in the world to do. And all you have to do is just say, Jesus, I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord, and I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. Now take my life 
and do something with it. And if you said that prayer today and you meant it, then you just became a child of God and now the resurrection himself lives on the inside of you. And the, the scripture says that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in you. Dwells in you. Amen. That's exciting. That really is. And and as he was as he was talking, you know, the scripture says in Luke, all, also in Luke, Luke 19, 13, he says, and he called he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. And that's going along with with the ascension. Occupy till I, I come back. You know, the story of, of the Good Samaritan was he, Jesus, Dad was talking about this on the Elijah stream yesterday. Jesus compared himself to the Good Samaritan and said, if I'm any longer in my coming, here's enough to take care of them till I come. And if I'm any longer, I will repay it when I get back. So he let you know, I am coming back. And... So he says, occupy till I come. Well, why are, let me, let me just, let me do this before I get, get super ahead of myself. The definition of occupy means this. Now just listen at the different definitions. This is from the Webster Dictionary. Occupy, it means to take up a place or extent in space, to take or feel an extent in time, to take hold uh, to take or hold possession or control of, to reside in as an owner or tenant. See, this is our temporary home, but we are supposed to own it while we're here. We're supposed to take up residence here. We're supposed to occupy here. We're supposed to take hold, take or hold the possession and control of this place. Why are we not doing it? That's in every area. He said, occupy till I come spiritually, physically, and financially. All of it. That's our job. And if we're not occupying it, then who is? If we're not taking the possession and, and control of this place that we're in right now, this place that we call earth, then who is? Who's, taking, who's occupying this place till he comes? What, what is he going to see when he comes back? Aren't you glad that you ain't God? Because you come back and say, what in the world? <laughs> what have you done to this place? This looks like in the beginning I created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face. of. That's what it looks like right now. And I love that meme. If, if Paul was still here, we'd be getting a letter. The church of Jesus Christ himself would be getting a letter. Greetings to you. The real church of Jesus Christ. I didn't finish the thing, so it's the real church of Jesus Christ. The body. It would say, what is it? greetings, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And they would say, you have done an awful job. <laughs> what in the world are you doing? We, we, we see you. We seen what you did. <laughs> Why, why are we not occupying? And here we are. We got pastors who have millions of followers on Instagram. Let me tell you who's occupying. People who are Christians in name only. We got, we got pastors who have millions of followers on Instagram saying, I wish God would have made gender more simple. Like here, A, B, C, and D, or saying, and this is a real video, guys. And he said, it was God who decided male and female. He said, I really wish I would have been there to say, can't you make something in between? I, I promise 
This is not me. This is not hearsay. This is this is a real video. Somebody sent me the other night, and it has disturbed me since I watched it. Yes, yeah, see knows Christians in name only. Saying, I wish God would have made it more simple. Okay, let me tell you something. Math is not, was never my strong suit. Never. I'm, I got it out there by faith that one day it will be. But I was never confused by one plus one equals two. I was never confused about that. That never confused me. I never had an issue with that. It was when you got into all the the different signs and all this kinds of stuff, and this one goes over this one, and you can get this one out of that. I, I, that, I didn't like that. But one plus one equals two. Man, I, I got that. Male and female. That's one plus one equals two. That's it. So here's my argument to that. Yes, God decided it was male and female. So... So let it be written, so let it be done. Like on the Ten Commandments. That's it. God decided, end of story, period, case closed, argument over. It says in the beginning that God, he decided that, the, that it would be morning and night, that it would be day and night. We never argue about that. The daylight and the nighttime. The darkness he would call night. You don't hear anybody argue about that. God, I wish you'd have made something in between. Well, we never argue about that. This is who's occupying. And they're millionaires. Now, I have nothing against a minister being a multimillionaire. I think that they should be the richest people on the planet. Because they're saving people from hell. But as long as you're preaching the truth. And then people get mad at us. Because we're standing here preaching actually what the Bible says. But nobody seems to get mad at people saying, I, I wish I would have said. And then, and then stand there and say, in his message and say, I, I, don't, I don't freaking know. I don't freaking know why God did this. This is a multi-millionaire pastor who has millions of followers. This is crap. Garbage. That trash is in the remix Bible. And I'm telling you, this is really happening. Really happening out there. This is why us, the ones, you, speaking the truth, we have got to occupy this place till he comes. And it's going to take finances to do it. We need to occupy in all three spaces, spiritually, physically, and financially. So that when... He does return. And we go to be with him for that awesome dinner. That the Antichrist starts his reign broke. This is why we need to occupy. So that we can use up all available platforms. So that we can spread the truth of God is absolutely good. Of Jesus is the only way. He's not just the way. He's not just the door. He's the only way. The only door. And it's only through Him and His blood that you will ever see heaven. And that you will ever experience eternal life. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Hell is real. And there's people going to it every day and it's absolute trash like that that's sending them there. Those are the people that would be getting a letter. And it's sending them there every day, but yet people want to get on to people for, for speaking just a little, little too crude behind the pulpit to preach the truth. Well, guess what they're listening to if they're not listening to that? Horse crap. Horse crap. Yeah. 
and they don't say crap. So my friends, we have got to occupy till he comes. And it's going to take all areas, spiritually, physically, and financially. I'm telling you, me just telling that, it's got the fortress in a stir around here. It, it's got it in a stir because this is absolute, it grieves your spirit to know that, that my, my nieces are, are being preached to like that. Why? Because when they scroll through Instagram and they scroll through TikTok, these are the people who have the money to get on there and occupy that space. So guess what they're going to see? Instead, we need to start telling people the truth. And it's going to take money to do it. Whether you like it or not, you can get mad if you want to, but you can stay broke. I don't care. If you're going to get mad, then just stay over there. But I want to see the body of Christ prosper so that we can reach these people that are going to hell. And if we're the ones on social media, if we're the ones on these reels, then when they pop up saying, I don't, I don't know why God didn't make it more simple. The next reel that they see says, let me tell you something. Jesus is the only way. He's the only way. And this is the way that you were created. And you have a destiny that's before you. You have a, a prepared table. God said that he knew you before you were even formed in the womb. And he knows the plan that he has for you this is what we need to be spreading the truth but the only ones that they see are lies and lies and lies and more lies and instead of us occupying these spaces we see Benadryl challenge take 10 Benadryls so that you can have a, a hallucinating experience and 13 and 14 year olds start taking it and they don't wake up. Yeah, so we so we build a, a gay transgendered bear, stuffed animal. Are you are you kidding me? A a stuffed the thing's not even alive. A gay stuffed animal. This is where we are at, at the moment. It would be funny if it wasn't pathetic. <laughs> Absolutely pathetic. And this is... This. Yeah, what is a rainbow bear going to do to protect you in a fight? It's going to run and hide because it don't, it don't want to get dirt on it. I, I don't even, I, I am so appalled by, uh, see, this has got the fortress in a stir. I, I'm so appalled by all of this happening. And this is the church that God is coming back after. You really think we're occupying this place right now? It's time we step up our game, my brothers and sisters. We got to step it up. You got to decide, like mom said Sunday, are you in it for the long haul? I'm in it to win it. And I mean it. You've got to decide today. Today. So we need to start occupying spiritually, physically, and financially. And the way that we occupy financially is start living the way that God told us to live in His Word. And in Luke 6, 38, He said, Give, 
and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You say, I believe it, I receive it, I call it done, and I choose this day to live in it. In Jesus' name. Now, if you're a tither, Malachi 3.10 says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field saith the Lord of hosts and all nations shall call you blessed for you shall be a delightsome land saith the Lord of hosts I believe it, I receive it I call it done and I choose to live in it this day Day in Jesus name it's time we start occupying amen, amen. so before I, I hand the mic back to dad this this love train this glo- groovy grace glory train the first stop that we make will be Louisville Kentucky this year and we are headed your way you wonder why certain people are not in the fortress today well they're on the road and we will be there soon to meet you all to to come together we will be at evangel world prayer center in louisville kentucky the meeting starts at 6 p.m eastern time it will be live streamed on evangel world prayer center's YouTube channel and we will post the link on all of our social medias. If you're in that area come see us. If you can't make it be sure to tune in. It is going to be a powerful powerful time. We are so excited and we'll see you soon. Amen. Hallelujah. They just showed me a picture of that bear. That's the ugliest damned bear I ever saw in my life. I'm t- And I meant it very seriously too. That's a damned bear. I said that very, very literal. You understand? Can you see people when I say that? (laughs) Brother Robin, I talk literal about stuff. And I'm telling you, that's that's a damned ugly bear. I mean, that's a wild-looking something. It don't even look natural. So, anyway, it's been good to be with you on the 11th hour today. It's been a good 11th hour today. It's been a strong 11th hour today. If you have never been baptized in the Holy Ghost, you need to do that today so that you have power and you have Holy Ghost fire power. Just say, Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, and then just start praying in tongues. Don't stop praying in English. But when you run out of something to pray in English, shift over into those tongues after that, and your prayer language and your prayer time becomes unlimited. Hallelujah. Well, it's been good to be with you today. We love you here on the 11th hour. I love all of our partners. I pray over you every day. And uh, then sometimes I even go as far as take communion over you as far as my authority can go uh, in your life because I want to see you prosper and and do well in every area hallelujah well until next time we gather together right here around god's word i want you to remember never forget that god is absolutely good shalom shalom Shalom.